see you on this uh, beautifully uh, post-storm calm day. Uh, thank you for taking the time uh, to come out and be with us today with uh, uh, Reverend Rose. It's been, uh, it's been a joy and a delight to have uh, she and her husband Ken here in Bermuda over this last little while. Yesterday we had a fabulous day together hearing about her story uh, as a as a girl growing up in Montego Bay and how the Lord called her and, uh, and uh, used her through something called the, the Church Army. How they, she then uh, came, found herself in England and uh, ultimately was appointed as a, uh, a chaplain to the Queen and also was um, uh, appointed as the first uh, female and the first uh, a black uh, chaplain to the Speaker of the House of Commons, which effectively is the... the um, well, would you, the rector or the priest in charge of the houses of houses of parliament, where she exercised much of her ministry, in addition to having a, a small parish church in the middle of the city of London. It's been a delight to uh, hear her story and uh, to share in her enthusiasm for faith and her common sense approach to living it out in a practical way, where you get on with the job and you allow God to be at work and to deal with all the mess that there has been and all the prejudice that there is uh, in a way which, where she has proven uh, her, herself in some senses that, that, that an extraordinary woman of God and not allowing these things to stand, uh, stand back. And we're very grateful to, to you, Rose, uh, for, for being here. And uh, we have about an hour together this afternoon. She'll be speaking a bit from the scriptures about the relationship of the Bible and race. And then there'll be an opportunity for questions. So uh, if you have a burning question, if you could wait till towards the end and make sure you jot it down so you don't forget it. Um, and then you have an opportunity to ask questions. But if you don't mind, I'm going to pause and pray uh, as we start. And uh, to thank God for this afternoon, for all those who are here to pray for Rose and to pray for each one of us that we would truly learn to love one another. Loving Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have now to come together as people from different places, different backgrounds, and different experiences. But we share this in common, that we are children of God made in your image. And we thank you for our sister Rose, who is now going to be sharing something of her, the wisdom of the scriptures and her own experience with us for these few minutes this afternoon. We pray, Lord, that you would open up our eyes once more to your goodness and to our common humanity. And we pray, Father, that you would bless these moments and enable them to be a means of bringing new life, healing, unity, love, joy, peace, all the things we crave for. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much for your warm welcome. I've thoroughly enjoyed my time so far with you. And uh, I really enjoyed St. Anne's, yes, St. Anne's this morning. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again in the future. Um, I've been told that I've got to come and have my sabbatical here. So, <laughs> so who knows? We'll see. Um, the title that we're looking at today is... Uh, race and the Bible, race and the Bible. And so I want to begin by reading in a typical Anglican way, something from the Old Testament and something from the New Testament. So first of all, from the Old Testament, from the Old Testament, from Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, etc., etc. 
the important thing there, verse 27, so God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. I want you to remember that passage as we speak. And then I also want to read a little bit longer from John's Gospel, from the New Testament, John's Gospel, John chapter 4. It's a familiar passage to many people, but I want us in the light of the, the theme today to think about this passage. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would give you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husbands. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then the disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. I want us to think for a moment about what you have just heard 
from that passage of scripture as we link that with what I'm about to share with you. So, in one of our recent collects, the collect is the prayer that we usually say before we have our readings, the liturgy of the word on a Sunday. We have the words, you have made us for yourself and our souls are restless until they find their rest in thee. You have made us for yourself and our souls are restless until they find their rest in thee. I once said to a group that I'm not particularly bothered about how many days it took God to make the world or whatever. I believe that God created the world. And I believe that God created us. And I believe that God created us in his own image. God created humankind in his own image. It seems to me that there is nowhere, and I have tried looking in particular with this topic, that there is nowhere in scripture that tells me that God created different kinds of human beings. And so I am convinced from what I have read, from what I have seen, that God created human beings. God created human beings. One human race. And we are accustomed to that one human race being called Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens. However, somehow, somewhere down the line, someone had a bright idea. The bright idea was that there are different kinds of human beings. Different kinds of human beings. J. Cameron Carter asserts that a certain group of people have compounded the sin in terms of the way they treat others by transforming the desire for domination and mastery over others into a science. And that science has created the dismal history of patriarchy, racism, colonialism, etc. And so he uh, has said that race as we know it today is a social construct. Race is a social construct and not an empirically observable biocultural phenomenon. That's a bit of a mouthful, whatever that means you take from that. And in terms of race being a social construct, you can begin to see that in order, in order for us to treat human beings in a particular way, then you have to make them a little less than human beings. That is the reality. Because if you are as I am, if you are a human being like me, then I can't treat you less than. And so one develops a theory that says that human beings or this particular group of human beings are less than. They're not as good as. And so once you have that theory well established, then you can have uh, things uh, like the transportation of people from one part of the world to another. Then you can have uh, a situation in the same way, for example, let's think about how we treat women or how we treat children. If they are not as good as we are, then we can afford to treat them in a particular way. But I want to suggest to us that if we are the body of Christ, if we belong to God, truly belong to God, then we need to think again about the humankind that God has created, that God has made in his image. Because to treat people less than is actually to be saying that God didn't quite know what he was doing. He didn't quite know. And we know better. A few years ago, when we had uh, the, the crisis in Bosnia, 
I was ironing one day. I lived in Wolverhampton at the time. And I was doing my ironing. The television news was on. And there I saw young men emaciated behind barbed wires. They were not black. They were not Christian, but I remember stopping and weeping at what I saw. Why? We shared something in common, and that was a common humanity, a common humanity. And the problem, I think, for us is if we make others less than human, then actually we don't need to care about what happens to them because they're not as good as we are. That's the problem, that as Christians, if we name ourselves Christians, that we have to challenge ourselves and each other about, if they're not as good as. And so when you have a whole group of people that is taken and used in a particular way, then we have to think again. I believe very much that we have one human race, I also believe that we have what I would regard as different ethnic groups, a variety of ethnic groups. I believe we have different cultures. We cannot change who we are. We cannot change our ethnicity. But we often change culture. We move. We move for, around in different cultures. Culture is dynamic. It is changing. But our ethnicity remains the same. We might try different things. We might not like who we belong to. And we might try to change that. But it is who we are. And so at some point, we need to be comfortable in our skin, in our ethnicity in terms of who we are. Now, I grew up in Jamaica, and we have a motto in Jamaica that says, out of many, one people. Out of many, one people. And so I genuinely grew up knowing that I was a human being and that others were human beings. I genuinely did. And because I lived in Montego Bay, there were always lots of tourists. So I grew up knowing that there were some people who were white and some people who were pink and blue and green, and, but that we were all human beings. And in particular, if you heard those who lived there a long time, you know that culturally they had adapted to being there. So you might see a white face but their Jamaican could be so broad that they were most definitely, without mistake, they were Jamaicans. So out of many, one people. But of course, the reality is that sin exists. Sin exists. And part of the existence of sin is that it tries to create a kind of domination that allows us to treat people differently, either because of the color of their skins, or because they have less money, or because they live in a particular part of town. And that is, that is the sin, where we do not receive each other as children of God, children of God, made in God's image. And so in the passage of John that I read, you have Jesus being a Jew, and of course this, what I would regard as an ethnicity, problem that Jews had with Samaritans. And there are other passages of scripture um, where we're told it was, you know, remember the story of the good Samaritan? It is the good Samaritan who stops and helps this person who had been beaten up. So the Jews and the Samaritans, never the twain shall meet. But on this occasion, Jesus actually, from a different context, meets with this woman, meets with this woman at the well. Someone, in the first instance, he shouldn't be talking to a woman because she's a woman. And not only is she a woman, but she's also a Samaritan woman. So stay away. But Jesus engages her, even though she is from a different ethnic group, even though she is 
from a different cultural background, Jesus engages with her. Jesus uses uh, the language that she can understand and he speaks to her. But he doesn't start speaking to her by preaching to her. He asks her for a drink of water. So in other words, Jesus engages with her socially. Socially. Sometimes we expect people to come into our church and that we will preach to them. And then we see them on the street during the week and we don't know them. We don't recognize them. These are our brothers and sisters that we share the peace with on a Sunday. And Monday to Saturday, don't know them, don't see them. That can't be right. That can't be right. It is important for us to get to know each other socially. Socially. It is important that we sit and eat together, that we break bread together. And so if we're breaking bread with each other on a Sunday and still not knowing each other, then we need to do something about that. Jesus shows an interest in her socially. And as the conversation develops, notice that this woman tries to, as it were, live in the, um, you know, I am a Samaritan, you are different sort of context. Let me just find that passage again. Where the woman begins to say, this happens here, that happens over there. How is it that you, a Jew, you're asking me for a drink? And why shouldn't he? He was thirsty. It was normal. It was natural. He was doing something very, very natural. But she says, how is it that you're asking me, a woman of Samaria, for a drink? And it is then that Jesus says, well, if you know who was really asking, you would be asking me for a drink. And then she goes on to address the reality, her reality. You people, you say, or, or our father, let me find the exact bit. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. So again, she finds something that pulls a curtain down, separates them. We are always finding things that separates us from each other. It is a human condition. I often said to my congregation in, in Hackney, and I mention Hackney a lot because I spent the most of my years there, over 16 and a half years there, compared to the other places where I have served. I often say to them that when we get things wrong, when we do the wrong thing, get things wrong, let's not stay there. Let's recognize ourselves as spiritual beings having a human moment instead of the other way around. Yes? We are spiritual beings having a human moment. And so we therefore have the potential to get up and to move on and be the spiritual being that God has called us to be in the reality of making us in his own image. So it is a sort of, you know, you go to church there and, and I go to church on that side. But really, really, that might be true. But, but, Jesus is trying to say to us that because that fact exists, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is true, that it should be continued. Because we've often behaved in a particular way, because we've often treated certain people in a particular way, that is a fact that we've done it but it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to continue to behave in that way. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus' response is, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. 
neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. If you read through also some of the New Testament readings, and certainly in Galatians, you will find that the church was struggling in, in Galatia. They were struggling in the New Testament over this same problem of Gentiles versus Jews. And in that struggle, Paul was challenging Peter and the others. He was actually ashamed of their behavior. And so, for example, in Galatians chapter 2, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood self-condemned. For until certain people came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. The church, the world is full of factions. We need to know where do we stand and who do we stand with? And it must be the Christ that we stand with. And so Paul was clearly saying that even those who used to sit and eat with the Gentiles, now because this group came in who were particularly stressing that they had to be circumcised, they had stopped. And even Barnabas, we're told. And the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy. Even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. It is a human moment that Barnabas was having. A human moment that this group were having. They had forgotten what it meant to be in Christ. And so Paul reminded them in verse 19 of chapter 2, I am crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We are crucified with Christ. The life we now live is a life that we live in Christ. In other words, our identity is in Christ I am crucified with Christ. That means sometimes our class, our culture, our history, our color, our tradition, we are crucified in Christ. So the new life that we lead ought not to be one that puts us in different boxes. And so, I am a Christian. I am a woman. I am a child of God. And I want to be known in that light. The fact that I am black is an added bonus. The fact that you are white is an added bonus. But it is not completely who we are. And so we cannot keep defining people by the color of their skins alone. We cannot do that because there is much more to them. The truth of the gospel overrides uh, those things. We must be Christians first. We must be the people of God first before we recognize ourselves or before we see ourselves in a box that says we are black or we are white or we are pink or blue or gay or straight or all the other uh, uh, adjectives that we use to describe ourselves. It is important, I believe, that we understand the nature of who we are as the people of God made in his image, male and female. And it is because I am made in God's image why I walk with an air of confidence, an air of confidence in being a woman, an air of confidence in being black, an air of confidence in being whatever my cultural background is. And you ought to have that same air of confidence. It doesn't make me any more or any less. And so as we go through scripture, what we see is uh, an attempt, a human attempt from time to time to segregate. But Christ changes that. Christ changes that. And so if we are in Christ, we are a new creation, a new people. There is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, but we are all one in Christ. 
and the need for us to live as though we are one in Christ is particularly pertinent for the Christian community. And that is why yesterday when I mentioned to you my sadness in Ghana at seeing a Christian church built above where people were exercising worship while people were dying in horrible conditions below. That should never have happened. And so as Christians, as human beings, we often fail to live up to who we ought to be, who we should be in Christ. You are my brothers and sisters in Christ. The fact that the paint work is a little bit different is almost irrelevant. It is just telling you something about uh, my geography, possible geography. And we shouldn't make more of it than that, realistically. So, how then do we go forward as members of the body of Christ? How do we begin to truly relate to each other? How do we shift the baggage? Because it is a baggage. How do we shift the baggage that we have carried for so long? And we've often carried the baggage because we are wanting to be true to our traditions, our, the generations of those who've gone before. But actually what we need to be saying is, what does Christ want me to be and do? How does God want me to live with my neighbor? Should we continue to uh, continue to perpetuate this evil of us not treating each other as one, as brothers and sisters? Or do we break that cycle? Do we start from today and break that cycle and reach out to one another? Because it is only when we do that that we will truly be able to receive the gifts that each other brings. Jesus could not drink water. Jesus could not have his thirst quenched if he did not break through the barrier of the them and us. And also the Samaritan woman could not be free if she too did not break through the barrier of the them and us. Look what Jesus did. She goes off. Jesus is now able to to speak to her spiritually, having had that social connection. He speaks to her spiritually, assists her, helps her, and she now moves on and becomes, in a, in a sense, an evangelist because she goes and she says, look, I have found the Messiah. At least I think he is the Messiah because he has told me all these things. Her life is changed. Our lives needs to be changed by the gospel. And so I know in South Africa we had the Dutch, the Dutch Reformed Church who somehow decided to use the scripture to perpetuate the evil of apartheid. And that's what it was. It was an evil. The church needs prophets in its midst. The church needs prophets in its midst who is going to challenge the status quo. The church needs prophets who will tell us the truth, speaks the truth within its midst, and enable us to grow as the body of Christ so that we can reach out to one another as God would have us. Do you notice that very often when things are happening in other parts of the world, they're happening in the Middle East or they're happening in, in Afghanistan or in other parts of the world, we tend to, it's there, and we almost become so desensitized that we don't hear them. Another bomb goes off and hundreds are killed. And it's as though we don't hear. Why? It is because we don't recognize their humanity. Notice the way, and I've noticed it in Britain in particular, um, I notice that when something happens, 
as soon as a Brit is involved and we hear, and they're quick to tell us, and, and the newspapers, you know, that brings us the, the, the news, they must also take some responsibility for this. We need to start recognizing each other's humanity in Christ as made in the image of God. And so we must weep, you know, those children that we see running around in winter conditions, barefooted, they must be our children too. And only when they become our children that we will be moved to do something about it. So I want to challenge us. I want to challenge us to, to look with new eyes, with fresh eyes on the world. I want us to be reminded that the scripture that we read tells us of a God who created humankind, one human race, homo sapiens, that we belong to. And we can no longer take on board the separation of humanity, putting them in different uh, brackets and then making them less than that which God intended for them to be. We belong to one another. We belong to each other. And it doesn't matter what happened in the past. We now need to think, what sort of world, what sort of legacy do we want to leave behind for our grandchildren? and great-grandchildren? What sort of legacy do we want them to, to have of Bermuda, of the wider world? And only when we've answered that question will, we, will that determine how we respond in terms of how we go forward together as the people of God, the one people of God. Actually, if you look in Scripture, there is nothing in Scripture that talks about different denominations. And you could say that that is a, another sin that we have created. And this, it is this thing of separation. There is nothing in Scripture. It speaks about the church of God in Corinth. It speaks about the church in, uh, in, in Rome, the church in uh, Galatia, the church in... Uh, um, what are the different uh, places? Yes, yeah, it speaks about, it doesn't speak about denomination. But we created that because we can't stand being with each other. <laughs> That's what we've done. That's what we've done. And, and I think that there ought to be a longing for us to really be the people of God, whereby we do not build walls and I hope someone would send that message along to Mr. Trump. <laughs> we, do not, we do not build walls, but we create a, a kind of world whereby we can reach out to one another. We can uphold each other. We can correct each other. We can love each other because we are one human beings. We don't even need to, you know, to fight about our ethnicity. The one term that I couldn't bear, my husband happens to be a Geordie from the northeast of England, but the one term I couldn't bear is people referring to my children as half-caste. What does that mean? What does it mean? Does it mean that they're half-human and half-something uh, else? It's ridiculous, totally ridiculous. So you begin to see that even the language that we use somehow tries to separate people from each other. So my hope and my challenge for us is that as we go forward, we will break the barriers down that we find. But if we're going to break the barriers down, we have to acknowledge that they exist. We have to acknowledge that they exist. We've got to put our hands up and say that they exist. And we have to ask, why does this exist? And it might be history, it might be tradition. And then we have to ask ourselves, do we want to, do we really want to continue this? 
And if the answer is yes, we want to continue to perpetuate these barriers, then we have to search deeply in our hearts and ask why. Because there is something unequal about that. And actually, one of the reasons why I was very much in favor, apart from the fact that I felt called to ministry, I was very much in favor of women being in ministry, is actually because I believe that God, in his creation of male and female, calls us all, calls all the baptized. Now, there was a time when black people were not allowed to, to be in the ministry, we, you know, because they thought, you know, those in authority at the time thought they couldn't possibly um, bring the, it, it, people had to fight to, 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 to actually offer and, and, and be priests within the church. And the same thing, we've had the history in terms of women, the same thing. And it is because I believe that God calls us all who are baptized to proclaim the good news, male and female, human beings. And what we do in that proclamation is show the love of God, the love of God. Anything short of that is uh, not welcomed in God's presence, I believe. And so we have to think again and challenge ourselves again and ask, where are the prophets in our midst? Where are the prophets to speak the truth to power to speak the truth to inequality, to speak the truth to injustice when we see it, to name it for what it is, but to do so lovingly, lovingly, not with a whip, because otherwise we will just be perpetuating what they, others have done before. We don't need a whip, but we need to do this with love. I want to stop because time is flowing on, and I want to take your questions, which will perhaps help to um, add other things. Thank you. Thank you. I just want you to pause for a few moments, if you like. Um, and again, as we did yesterday, just uh, perhaps turn to your neighbor for two seconds and say something that, you, something that inspired you, something that you'd never thought about, perhaps, just for literally uh, 20 seconds, just to turn to your neighbor and have a, a brief chat. And then while we do that uh, and we allow things to settle, then I'll open the floor for questions. So if you don't know the person sitting next to you, the first thing you can do is introduce yourself. Anyway, so with that, uh, 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 did I see a question being formed here? And please do speak in clearly into the mic if you're able to. We want to record these sessions so we can need to hear the question and the answer. Thank you. Good afternoon. I, I wasn't here yesterday, so this question may have already been asked. What was it like when you were appointed to the Queen, and what challenges did you endure? Uh... One of the wonderful things is that Her Majesty, um, her involvement in the Commonwealth means that she's always had uh, people of all different kind of ethnic backgrounds around her. Um, so, you know, I, I really don't think I experienced anything negative from that perspective at all. Um, I think there were probably others who were surprised, um, but you know, they've got to deal with their own surprise. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, and, and certainly when I was appointed as a, a, a chaplain to the house, um, that had its challenges then. Um, but I think you learn. You learn to identify the challenges, and then we've got to ask ourselves, those of us who meet certain challenges, you have to recognize that actually it is not my problem, it is your problem. And so you deal with it. You know, and because otherwise we can become bogged down and we can start holding up a mirror saying, oh, I don't like this about myself because, you know, people don't like me. But actually I love myself because God created me. And so anyone who doesn't, it is their loss. So, for example, actually, I just remember those who didn't want me to do their funerals or whatever they didn't want me to do, would I be upset about it? If I am honest, I would say the human part of me is sad. But I then recover myself very quickly. 
and I hope I'm allowed to say this word in the, in, the, in the church grounds, but I would often think, actually, Rose, it is their loss because you do a damn good funeral. <laughs> Any other questions? You, you can't hire her for your funeral, however. I don't know if that's... <laughs> Thank you, Reverend Rose. I really enjoyed yesterday, and this brought the cap on today. Thank you. Thank you for coming to Bermuda. I think many of us will leave this place having felt that your time in Bermuda was well spent. Thank you. I can certainly go back 60 plus years and say to you directly, and others that are much older than me, may or may not want to attest that this would not have been so for you to come visit us in such a manner today. So I'm very thankful to you, and I pray that God's blessing will continually be stirred upon you as you move up and, up and down the world, Thank telling you. it just like it is. Thank you. May God bless you. So, in the room, there's an awful lot of pain. And we don't like to bear that generally in front of onlooking eyes. And the question is, so with that pain, there has been offense. How do we deal with that without dehumanizing ourselves in the process? I think uh, we have to begin from a place where we recognize uh, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so others' failure is our failure too. Others' sin is our sin too because we share that common humanity. And it is not about pointing fingers at each other, because that will not help. I think what we need to do is to understand the hurt and the, the pain. I, I'll give you an example. I went to a, a, for a job once, and I sat in the room I sat in the room waiting to be called in for my interview. The chair of the panel came in, looked at the two of us who were there, a male and a, fem a, a, male and a female were sitting there, myself included, and, and said, I've come to get the next person for their interview, but I can see they're not there, and walked back out. The male was white, I was black. It was clear that it was not the male, it was a woman, my name is Rose, not very many men are called Rose for their first <laughs> names. So it was interesting for me that the paperwork that he had in front of him when he came out to get the next person for their interview, he could not envisage it being this woman who was sitting there waiting. That is painful. That is difficult because it is, it is telling you something about yourself whom you thought you knew. Um, and so you have to acknowledge the hurt and the pain, but you then have to strategically say, well, what do I do with this? What do I do with this? And sometimes, unfortunately, we carry it. We carry it. The story is told, actually, of two, uh, of a, a group uh, of, of monks who belonged to an order that were not meant to relate to women at all. They're not meant to talk to women, touch women, completely out of the question. And they were on a journey one day and they came across a woman who was trying to cross the river. 
And uh, there was no way she would have crossed it without being lifted across. And one of them lifted her across, put her down, and kept walking. And after they'd gone for many more miles, the other one said to him, what on earth did you do that for? You know, you did something really wrong. And he thought, what have I done? And he said, you can't, we're not meant to talk to women, never mind carrying them, touching them, but you carried this woman. And the response back was, I put her down way back there. You are still carrying her. <laughs> yeah. so, so sometimes we've got to find the way of putting down. And so when I tell the stories of things that has happened to me in the past, I tell them in a context of what is relevant, but not in a context where it is, uh, uh, let me try and explain it a different way. Does it hurt? Yes, it did hurt. But I will not allow it to continue to dominate my life. But it is difficult if you continue. So with the same person who said that, two more jobs that I applied for, um, I wasn't even shortlisted. So I asked, I wrote to this person and I said, I would like a written um, letter from you telling me which of these essential criteria you think I am lacking, why you haven't shortlisted me. He didn't want to write, put anything in writing. He said, I would see you. And when he saw me, he couldn't tell me what I was lacking, why I wasn't shortlisted. And so my way of dealing with it in terms of drawing a line underneath it, was to look him squarely in the eye and say, I will not apply for anything else in your jurisdiction. Because when you didn't know who I was, you were willing to shortlist me. Now that you know I'm black, you're not willing to shortlist me. I will not ingratiate myself by coming before you once more. So what that does for me is to take control so somewhere along the line, <clears throat> when we meet these situations, we have got to find a way, one, to acknowledge the pain and hurt, because it can be very painful, it can be very hurtful. And I always say, I never let anyone see my tears. I never let them, you know, that group who has behaved in that way to me, see my tears. My tears are too precious but I need to find a way of expressing those tears <clears throat> and then find a way to go back to them and challenge their behavior. I don't know if that helps you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. May I call you Rose? Please do. That's, okay. that's, that is um, my question is, have you noticed any attitudinal differences to yourself since the Brexit vote? Um, attitudinal difference since Brexit. Um, there are others who have experienced um, unpleasantness on, on public transport and otherwise. Personally, I haven't, no. But there are others who have said that they have experienced that, and I, I, I have no reason to doubt them. I think that there can be an underlying uh, undercurrent um, that is most unhealthy. Um, racism exists in our society. Racism is a sin. It is an evil. And uh, I, I think um, we cannot underestimate it or call it something different. Uh, we need to acknowledge that it is there, and then we need to work together to remove it from our midst. Um, because, you know, I, I'm always stressing that we share a common humanity, always, in every circumstances. Reverend Rose, my question to you is, um, you speak of common 
humanity. Mm -hmm. But at times, the church is very loving, and the church is very evil and cruel mm -hmm. to us as human beings. Can you speak to that a little bit, please? I, I think you're right, uh, and, and certainly in the context of the ordination of women, that was a very painful, very, very painful experience as a woman trying, uh, seeking ordination within the church. And it has not really gone away because there is a sense in which we feel as though the church um, has tried desperately to uh, not to upset the men in the church. But it's okay if we upset the women. And maybe that's because we, we are accustomed to pain. Think of the pain of childbirth. <laughs> we are accustomed to pain and we, we bear it well. And, and so from that perspective, I can forgive. And we have to forgive. Um, but we need to find a way of lovingly responding as Christ did on the cross. Christ on the cross is our example of forgiving. Um, and we just have to try and pattern that. It is hard. The, 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 cross, the cross was uh, an agonizing experience. And I'm always reminded, we once had a discussion in our general synod about security. The clergy having secure tenorship and all that sort of stuff. And when I got up to speak, I said, actually, I can find nowhere in scripture where we're told that we're called to something safe and secure. It's not there. Foxes of holes, the birds of the air of nest, the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. So I think as Christians, we have been given that added coverage, as it were, of the Holy Spirit to... Uh, to withstand, to withstand. And we just need to dig deep. We need to dig deep and not allow the past to dictate the present and the future. We can create a new future. It is ours to make. Think of a tapestry. Think of how rugged the other side of the tapestry is when you look at the wrong side of it. It's messy. It's got bits going all over the place. But when you look at the front side of it, how beautiful it is. We can create a beautiful tapestry here in Bermuda about who we are as the people of God, as the Christian church. And for that to happen, every single one of us will need to put that thread in, interlock that thread with each other. But of course, from time to time, we glance at the back and we see the, the mess. But we know that something beautiful can be produced from it all. And we need to trust God for that. And, and I think as Christians, as Christians, we must not allow ourselves uh, to, um, to be walked on. That's one thing. We shouldn't allow ourselves to be walked on. But we should not turn around and walk on each other either. And sometimes uh, we, uh, we think, you know, oh, we've got the upper hand now. But that's not what Christ would do. That's not what Christ would do. So we show love. We show love and we show forgiveness. But we do not allow ourselves, because we are children of God. And so we do not allow others to walk all over us. But we stand firm in love as we challenge each other to be the people of God. There's a hand way over there. And probably the last question, I think, given our, our time. But, uh, and this is last, one last burning question that's lurking within. Depends on how long Paul has got. It's about 20 minutes, Bishop. Yeah. <laughs> Rose, it's lovely to have you Good in Bermuda, you and uh, we hope to see you again. We know from the newspaper that institutionalized racism exists in all sorts of organizations. I think of the Met, I think of all sorts in politics, in business. Within the church, as you know it, from a Church of England perspective, 
is there any formal structure for tackling racism? There's all sorts of structures to tackle all sorts of other issues of the day. But when it comes to racism, especially when it is always underneath the surface, we see it erupt from time to time. We saw it in Toxteth, we saw it in Liverpool, we saw it in my home city of Manchester. Is there anything the church is doing on a formal level to tackle institutionalized racism? That's a very good question, and I'm glad you mentioned institutional racism. Because um, racism does become institutionalized, and, and that is why things just happen and keep happening until we challenge it, until we change it. The church created uh, an organization that we called Black Anglicans Concerns, and it is now called the Committee for Minority Ethnic Anglican Concerns. Quite a mouthful. It is a committee that is trying to work with minority ethnic people within the church in terms of encouraging them to offer themselves um, into leadership roles within the church, because that's one thing. If you think of the church, we cannot have a church where the leadership is entirely white. It is unacceptable. The leadership of the church ought to reflect the people who are there in the church. It, 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 it must happen. Um, and, and so that's a big thing that we are still trying to, to, to knock on its head. The problem is that we often hide behind the leadership of the church often hide behind, well, the people might not want somebody black to lead them. Why not? So as a bishop within the church or archdeacon or whatever the, the, the title is, if you think the people are saying that, then you ought to be challenging that. You ought to be saying to the people in the vestry, or the church committee, whatever you call yourselves, tell me why, what is your rationale? It's the same way, for example, when you've had a woman in a particular role, and if the woman makes a mess and she gets it wrong, then you hear, oh, we can't have another woman. But I don't hear people saying, oh, we can't have another man. We never hear them say that. That's because what we have is, this is normal. Men are normal. White people are normal. So what I want to say is that we need to reach a place where all people are normal. And all those who inhabit the space of normality, I want you to shift over and allow me in that space of normality too, so that we can all be normal together. Because if we're all normal together, then if I get something wrong, it doesn't matter. You can still have another woman. You can still have another black person. But, but you know, it's, it's the way in which we, if it's the woman or it's the black person, oh, we'd better not. So I would be honest with you and put my hands up that I know that I'd better be a darn good chaplain to the Speaker of the House of Commons. <laughs> <laughs> Because, because if I'm not, that's it for black women and women. <laughs> and we can't have that. So, so I, I think the church still has a long way to go. I'm constantly reminding the church that, and I said this yesterday, that if, we, um, if the Church of England, if there weren't black people in certain parts of the London diocese, some of our other inner cities, the Church of England would not have a presence in those places. So the Church of England has got to grab this by the collar and deal with it because young black people are leaving the church because they can't see any images of themselves. You know, when I grew up, I could see images of myself in all walks of life. So I knew that I could become what I wanted to be. I must tell you this story as my husband is here, so I must tell you this. I hope he doesn't mind. When my husband got his first appointment as a... Uh, a prison chaplain, they sent him to rural Oxfordshire. They were sending him to rural Oxfordshire. And, and I remember saying to him when he told me, I said, darling, I don't want to go to rural Oxfordshire. I want to be in the city. I want my children to be where they will see images of themselves. 
And, and he said, but darling, you know, they've, that's what they've offered me. And I said, can I have your boss's telephone number? <laughs> Do you remember? <laughs> and I got his boss's telephone number and I contacted his boss and I said, my husband has informed me that you have given him an appointment in rural Oxfordshire, but I don't want to go to rural Oxfordshire. And I told him why. I said, I want my children to see images of themselves. And to my horror, the voice at the other end of the line said, well, there are lots of black people in the prisons. <laughs> and, and I said, I said, but that's not the images that I want for my children. <laughs> so he didn't go to rural Oxfordshire. As the bishop comes forward, I just want to say that this is a work in progress. We need to still work at eradicating all forms of inequalities, of injustices, wherever we find them, in whatever context, because together we are the body of Christ. And if part of the body is excluded or treated differently, it will hurt. And it ought to hurt for all the body. Thank you. So we are very grateful to Rose for coming and for her husband being with her also in these few days. And this is an ongoing conversation so that you're aware of the context. Some of you were not here yesterday. Um, it's arisen out of a desire for us as a church to acknowledge the contribution of all of our Anglicans throughout history and particularly the contributions that have been given by black Anglicans to the life of the church because without which there would be no church in Bermuda. So we want to, in, 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 as much as we can, to be acknowledging, celebrating, rejoicing in that amazing heritage but it's about how do we then now live that's the issue but uh, to as part of our celebration and uh, as part of our acknowledgement um, Grace and uh, Grace Rollins you want to stand you know Grace everyone knows Grace anyway she's pulled together this committee and we're trying to gather stories anecdotes music uh, pictures or anything that you may have which speaks about the contributions that those people who have been ignored and who have not been recognized over the many centuries, what they have given to the life of this community and to the life of this church, uh, with a view to celebrating that and also with a view to now, what kind of people do we want? It is my firm conviction, along with Rose, that we need a church that reflects at every level this community. And it's been my struggle to find people who will willingly step up. And if we don't celebrate, uh, that which has been given and con contributed, then we don't have much of a hope to attract people to think about, actually, I am part of the body of Christ in this place for the future. So I, I hope that the conversation is going to continue, and I hope, Rose, that you would help us on this journey. As we've heard much about wh what the contribution has been in Jamaica and in the Church of England and how the extraordinary things that God has done through her life and through the life of many others. So I hope that you'll participate with us as we go through this exercise. I don't know if you have anything you want to say, Grace, at this stage. And it looks like she does. Hey, jingles, girl. Yeah, there we go. Yes, Bishop, I'm asking all of you to join us in this quest. Give us your letters, your diaries, your paintings, anything. We will take tender, loving care of your memorabilia and return it to you in good order. So please step up. Everybody here must know an Anglican who has done something, a black Anglican who has done something, either in the church or the community, that is worthy of being acknowledged and celebrated. These people were rooted in faith, which is the, the title of our project. And they persevered against great odds in the church and outside it. There was no, no surcease, no relief. But they continued to do the best they could, and they deserve nothing less than now to be recognized. So please, help us. Thank you. <laughs>